This is Andre, your host. The Old Testament predicted not only the first coming, but also the second coming of Jesus. Jesus himself told his disciples to read the signs of the times. He is telling us to do the same. Francois will now continue with his very interesting lecture on the signs of Jesus' soon coming. In our previous lecture, I took you to Rome and showed you this arch called the Arch of Titus. He was the Roman general who besieged and captured Jerusalem in 70 AD. When he saw the architectural beauty and splendor of the Jewish temple, he decided to preserve it for posterity. But his soldiers acted contrary to his strict orders and set this beautiful temple alight. How does one explain it? Only in the light of Bible prophecy. Matthew 24 verses 1 and 2 Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? he asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another and every one will be thrown down. Come with me to the Temple Mount where the beautiful temple, the pride of the Jewish nation, once stood. As you can see, not a single stone from the previous temple can be found. Prophecy has been accurately fulfilled. The Dome of the Rock testifies to the truth of Bible prophecy. Two thousand years ago, the Jews and Romans saw the beautiful temple going up in flames on this very same spot. After the fire completed its work of destruction, the Roman soldiers overturned every single stone in search of molten gold. What happened to the huge heap of overturned temple stones? The Turkish Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent built the present Jerusalem wall in 1542 AD and used the very stones that once made up the construction of the temple from the time of Christ. The Wailing Wall at Jerusalem where thousands of Jews worship today was not part of the original temple complex. It was part of the protecting wall that surrounded the area. This piece of wall is very precious to the Jews because it reminds them of the glory, the former glory of their marvelous temple. This is a representation of the conqueror of Jerusalem, Titus, who later became the emperor. He tried to prevent the destruction of the temple, but his efforts crumbled before the mighty prophetic words of Jesus. He is holding a Roman banner, which, by the way, all Roman soldiers worshipped. Jesus calls the Roman system the abomination that causes desolation. Matthew 24, 3 As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said. When will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? In our previous lecture we looked at the fulfillment of the specific prophecies from the time of Christ up to the time of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. In this lecture we are going to discover what Jesus predicted concerning the prophetic events that would take place after 70 AD. You are looking at the Colosseum where an estimated 80,000 Christians were set alight or killed by lions. Was this part of what Jesus predicted? Yes. This is a statue of Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Historians tell us that he delighted in persecuting Christians. He used to tie the legs of his victims onto two horses and watch how these poor Christians were torn asunder. Jesus predicted this kind of persecution in Matthew 24, 9. He says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. While you're looking at Emperor Marcus Aurelius on his horse, I'm reminding you of the fact that Jesus called the Romans the abomination that causes desolation. They were abominable in that they destroyed God's temple and Jerusalem. They were abominable because they persecuted God's people. They were abominable because of sacerdotalism, a degraded religious system where the priests exercised supernatural powers. We discussed some of these abominable features in our previous lectures. We also discovered previously that Jesus borrowed the term abomination that causes desolation from the prophet Daniel. This term is repeated four times, Daniel 8.13, 9.27, 11.31 and 12.11. 
and every time it refers to Rome. We've also made the shocking discovery in Daniel 8 that the little horn, the abomination that makes desolate, is not only pagan Rome but also papal Rome. Why? Because papal Rome also is a false religious system that destroys not only people but also the beautiful message of the high priestly work of Jesus in the sanctuary which says that sinners are saved by faith in Christ alone. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 refers to the papacy in this way. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself over everything that is called God and is worshipped, and even sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now Paul and Jesus are referring to the same enemy, which is Rome. How did Reformation scholars regard the papacy? Three biblical terms were used in their literature, like, for instance, man of sin, abomination that makes desolate, and the little horn. Some of these scholars are well known, others are not too well known. John Wycliffe, for instance, quoted Jesus and Daniel and identified the Pope as the abomination that makes desolate. Wycliffe also applied the term abomination of desolation to the doctrine of transubstantiation imposed on people by the bishops under threat of excommunication. Do you know what transubstantiation means? It's the doctrine of the Mass which teaches that the bread, the host, changes into the actual body of Christ. I took this picture in Constance where John Huss was burned at the stake. Why? Because he identified the Pope as the man of sin. These early reformers studied the prophecies of Daniel and Jesus and fearlessly proclaimed their convictions. Do you recognize this reformer? It's Martin Luther. When you read his publications, you will notice that he used all three of these terms to identify the papacy, the little horn, man of sin, and the abomination that makes it desolate. I visited this beautiful church of John Calvin in Geneva. He preached the good news of God's free grace. He knew exactly what Jesus and Paul and Daniel meant when they wrote about the abomination that desolates, the little horn and the man of sin. Calvin said it was the papal system. But today the voices of the Protestant world concerning the false teachings and danger of Rome are silent. A sudden hush concerning the dangers of this system has fallen over the world. Instead of caution, a new friendship has begun. Why? Has the Bible predicted it? Yes. Revelation chapter 13 verse 3 says, One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound. But the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. I want to tell you that we are living in serious times. In a future lecture we will do an in-depth study of Revelation chapter 13. Now just before you become too judgmental of my Catholic friends, I want to say something. If you reveal intolerance towards people who differ with you, you reveal exactly the same spirit as Rome did. There are only two choices for us living in these end times. We either choose Christ and worship Him, or we choose the popular way and worship the Antichrist. We must ask ourselves the question, what kind of relationship do we have with Christ? Let us continue reading what Jesus predicted about the persecution of the abomination that makes desolate. We're reading from Matthew 24 verses 21 and 22. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect those days will be shortened. Jesus is here referring to the 1,260 years of papal persecution, which is mentioned seven times in scripture. It began in 538 and ended in 1798. 
Let's quickly go to Paris and visit St. Germain's and discover something about the persecution during the 1260 years of papal domination. At midnight on August 24, 1572, the bells of this church began ringing. This was the sign for the papists to slaughter the Protestants. As I stood here, I thought of the 70,000 people who lost their lives on that fatal St. Bartholomew night. They made up a very small portion of the almost 150 million people who were martyred by the abomination that desolates. A Catholic magazine states, Catholics say only 30,000 were slain. Protestants put the number at 70,000. We prefer the latter figure. If there were 70,000 Huguenots in Paris that night of the massacre, so much more justification for the slaughter. This comes from the Western Watchman, November 21, 1912. You are looking at a fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus made 2,000 years ago on the Mount of Olives. This is the cell where the papists locked up a young Huguenot girl of 15 years. All she had to do to free herself was to light the candle that was placed on this spot. This would be the sign that she recants and places human tradition above the Bible. Just before she died, after 38 years of hell in here, they released her. Time does not allow us to listen to the story of the massacre of the Waldenses in northern Italy. I drove up here and visited the valley of Angronia, the valley of the groans where at times the shed blood of the persecuted Waldensians changed the colour of the little streams to red. Looking down the prophetic stream of time, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 22, If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. The official recorded date of the cessation of the religious persecution by the Church of Rome in the Waldensian Valleys is 1776. Let's ask Jesus, the great prophet, to tell us more about the next great sign that tells us that his coming is near. Verse 29, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Can you still remember the date of the last official Catholic persecution, 1776? We will have to go back to the books of history to find out whether the sun was really darkened some time after 1776. Herschel, the great astronomer, frankly admits, The dark day, May 19, 1780, is one of those wonderful phenomena of nature which will always be read with interest but which philosophy is at a loss to explain. Do you notice the date? Mark 13, 24 also records this phenomenon. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened. Only four years after the persecution ceased, did this great sign of the nearness of Christ's return occur. Great and memorable events. The Connecticut legislature was in session at this time. So great was the darkness that members became terrified and thought the day of judgment had come. A motion was consequently made to adjourn. We serve a loving, considerate God. In 1780 he darkened the sun to tell us that he is coming soon to take us to a home where the sun of joy and happiness never sets, never darkens. Jesus gave us these prophecies to tell us that he is on his way to rescue us. Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus is coming soon. In order to have an eclipse, the sun, the moon and the earth need to be in line. But on May 19, 1780, they were not in line. I think a caring God just placed his big hand in front of the sun to tell us that he is coming soon. Matthew 24, 29 tells us of the next great sign. The stars will fall from the sky. Did this prophecy come true? Yes. On November 12 and 13, 1833, the world saw the greatest spectacle of falling stars ever. I'm quoting from the American Journal of Science and Arts of 1834, page 382. 
There was scarcely a space in the firmament which was not filled at every instant with these falling stars. At times they would shower down in groups, calling to mind the fig tree, casting her untimely figs when shaken by a mighty wind. Someone may be asking the question, How near is the end? When will Jesus come to take us home and end all this misery? Chronologically, we are living between Matthew 24 verse 29 and verse 30. 29 speaks of the falling stars. Listen to what verse 30 says. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with great power and great glory. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14 says, The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry on the day of the Lord will be bitter, the shouting of the warriors there. All the signs that Jesus predicted in the sun, moon and stars have been fulfilled. What will happen between 1833 and the second coming of Jesus? Daniel 12 verse 4 But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. This is a prediction that knowledge concerning the book of Daniel would increase at the end of time. And now we will have to consult history for more information. The unsealing of the book of Daniel took place when the 1,260-year period of papal dominance came to its end and the Pope was taken captive by Berthia, Napoleon's general in AD 1798. The combination of the exile of the Pope as well as the signs in the natural world led many Christians to a serious study of the prophecies. They wanted to know more about the events leading up to the second coming of Christ. You know, when I study the prophecies of the Bible in conjunction with history and archaeology, I really become excited. For millennia, nobody could decipher hieroglyphics. And then, just after Napoleon captured the Pope in 1798, the French deciphered the hieroglyphics of the Rosetta Stone. And it was not long after deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphics that scholars deciphered cuneiform writing in the form of Babylonian, Elamite and Persian writing. And suddenly a new world opened to biblical scholars. New information concerning the ancient world just flooded in. The authenticity of the prophetic book of Daniel was confirmed and knowledge concerning this marvelous book suddenly increased at a tremendous pace. And the Bible scholars all over the world studied the book of Daniel with new enthusiasm and they realized that the second coming of Jesus was imminent. Just as the Reformation sprang up independently in various countries throughout the Christian world in the 1500s, so too did the Advent movement in the 1830s. It was a worldwide movement who preached to the world that Jesus was coming soon. The global nature of this movement is one of the clearest signs that Christ's return is drawing near. More about this when we study the amazing messages of the three angels of Revelation chapter 14. What does the Bible tell us about the signs in the political world? Fighting off doomsday. This is the heading of a recent article in Time magazine. You are looking at Russian soldiers training for chemical warfare. This is what the front page cover looked like. What does it tell you? More than 25 countries may soon have nuclear or chemical weapons. Let's read the first paragraph. It says, whether the threat comes from North Korea or the Ukraine, the world frets about more fingers on the nuclear trigger. When I looked at this global arsenal, I was shocked. The political leaders are worried about certain countries that have nuclear weapons. They're also worried about certain countries that have chemical and biological arsenals. The magazine had this picture of a Russian intercontinental ballistic missile. It has a range of 13,000 kilometers. Let me quote from Harold Muller of the Hess Institute for the Study of Peace and Conflict in Frankfurt. 
He says, as discipline deteriorates, we have to be afraid that the custodians will become ineffective. I want to tell you something. Most politicians really do not have any hope for our planet. We have an overkill ability of almost 100. In other words, with the nuclear weapons at our disposal, we can wipe out our planet a hundred times over. What does the Bible say? Are we all going to perish in World War III? Matthew 24, 6 says, You will hear of wars and rumors of war, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Verse 7, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Don't let anybody tell you that we will all perish and be killed in Armageddon. In a later study from the book of Revelation, we will discover how this planet is going to come to its end. But it will definitely not be through World War III. This is what Jesus said and I believe his word. Luke 21 verses 25 and 26 There will be signs in the sun, moon and stars. On the earth nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehension of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Never in the history of this planet have we had so many nervous breakdowns and so many cases of coronary heart diseases. Planet Earth has come to a cul-de-sac. We simply don't have the solutions for our problems and things are just getting worse by the day. James Douglas said, The heart of the nations is sick with fear. Statesmen with their ears to the ground are terror-stricken and perplexed. You are looking at the fulfillment of the prophecy of Luke 21 verse 26 where it says that people will be perplexed and men's hearts failing them for fear. Let no one deceive himself. We are drifting, we are drifting toward a catastrophe. Written by Walter Lippmann. Matthew 24 verse 10 At that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate one another. Verse 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. You can decide for yourself whether this prophecy has come true. Let's take a look at the moral state of our planet. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Prophecy predicted what the front pages of our newspaper would look like today. I was shocked when I looked at this recent issue of Time magazine. It says, International Sex for Sale. An alarming boom in prostitution debases the women and children of the world. Let's see what's inside. Under the title, The Skin Trade, the caption reads, Feeding on disparities in wealth, the collapse of communism and increased mobility, the traffic in flesh is a horror of exploitation that shames the world's conscience. Mari 12, daughter of a prostitute in Bombay, has begun menstruating, which means she must now follow in her mother's footsteps. She is wearing a wedding dress in the hope that someone will marry her and take her out of the brothel. There she is. Tell me, is there any hope for this dear little child? No. Time magazine says there are millions of young girls who are forced into this debasing profession and their own parents are selling them. The only solution for the debasing miseries of this planet is the soon coming of Christ. And I do hope that he is coming very soon. Afterwards I climbed up to the crater of Vesuvius. 
When I stood here, I realized why God had to cover the terrible wickedness down below with volcanic ash and lava. He just couldn't allow things to continue ad infinitum. But when I looked at this heading, I had to apologize to Pompeii and Herculaneum. Defiling the children. The subheading says, In the basest effect of the burgoing sex trade, increasing numbers of boys and girls are chained into prostitution. Time magazine says that only a few years ago child prostitution was a rarity. Today the magazine says the numbers are staggering and it is spreading all over the world. One of the reasons the bureaus give for the explosion of child prostitution is the fear of AIDS in older prostitutes. Says the article, dozens of tourist agencies cater for this clientele, which is made up of both pedophiles, people who have sex with underage children, and pederasts, men having sex with little boys, taking advantage of lax law enforcement in the third world nations. What happens when their little lives are eventually totally wrecked? The article says that they are tossed away. In Thailand, for instance, when they become infected with AIDS, they are locked in prisons by the military government or even killed. How long do you think God will allow this cruelty to continue? Millions of homes are breaking up because of prostitution. Millions of young children are being destroyed because of the uncontrolled lust of sex maniacs. And millions more are dying because of AIDS and millions more will soon be dying. Said one statesman, we have tried so hard. We have failed so miserably. Can we expect another Vesuvius catastrophe to destroy our wicked society? The only hope for the sick and dying planet is the second coming of Christ. Please make some serious preparations for this glorious day. I'll tell you why. When Jesus comes, he is only going to take people to heaven that has allowed him to transform their lives. Please do not resist his cleansing work in your life. In a future lecture, we will be looking at the prophecy concerning the healing of the wound that the papacy received in 1798. We will also look at the number of the beast in Revelation 13 as well as his image and his mark. You will be astounded at the end time role of the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. He and the first beast will be the main role players just before Jesus comes. It's already happening. And now for the last sign coming from Matthew 24 verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. The last and greatest sign of all is the proclamation of the eternal gospel to all the world. More about this when we come to the messages of the three angels of Revelation chapter 14. We are serving a wonderful, considerate God. Before he comes, he will give every person on this planet the opportunity to either accept the gift of his salvation or to reject it. And once we have made our choices, he will come again. May God help you and me to accept his gift of salvation fully and continue to do so daily. Friend, Jesus said, just as they were in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They did not believe the warnings and were destroyed. How are we responding on the words of Jesus? Our decisions have eternal consequences. The choice is ours. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we live in a serious time of this world's history. Thank you for the signs whereby we can see that your coming is at hand. May we daily decide to follow you and prepare for that glorious day when we will see Jesus coming on the clouds of heaven. Amen.